is this equation over here, right? What is this equation over here? Well, that is basically the partial derivative, okay, is if, as we take the limit, limit change in t tends towards zero of the uh, extensive property of the control volume at a certain time, take away certain time plus change in t uh, divided by um, change in t. This one would give us the, if you are not convinced enough, it will give us the partial derivative change in time of the extensive property of the control volume, which for which from our previous equation we have found out as the integrate control volume, the density multiplied by the intensive property and a dv. We should be marked it as like that. Okay? So basically this one as we take the limit is the rate of change of this thing over here, right? Well this thing over here is as we take the limit is basically gonna give us the the extensive property of the control volume at, at a certain time. Yeah, correct. The extensive property of the control volume. That's why we're integrating and we are finding the rate of change of that. Remember how we started out in, in our basic equations, we all are, we are now dealing with the rate of change. Now, why is it the partial, 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 partial t? Well, I can just simply explain that because the, this b over here and this uh, density over here can be written in terms of a lot of uh, physics parameters, okay, as I showed you just now. The intensive property can be written in terms of volume, mass, or, or what, you, what you may have. That's why we want to differentiate that. Now, once we do the integration, we are going to get an equation, right? But we want to partially differentiate that in terms of time, holding the other variables as constant because we are looking at the change. That is why it's a partial, uh, partial the extensive property and partial t. Okay, so this one falls in line with this one over here, okay? And now we're left with these two over there. And for that, again, I need to erase. So I hope you can just keep track of this equation. Okay, I'll leave the, the material derivative as over there. Okay, or you know what? Uh, heck, it just erase this. Okay, because now we need to deal with the B1 and B2. Right. Okay, B1, what is B1? What do we have for B1? B1, okay, T plus a change in T divided by change in time. Okay. Now, B1 uh, for this value, okay, B1 at the T plus change in T, or the, extens the extensive property of 1 is basically this thing over here, okay, if you can see correctly. This one, we can just simply rewrite that as the, uh, let me just have a quick look, is going to be, yeah, okay, it's going to be the density, okay, which we'll label as density 1, and B1 of that certain point, and we're going to multiply that by the volume. Right? The volume. Okay? Remember, this, I'm sorry, divided by change in time. Okay, remember, the intensive property, right, is gonna be in terms, is the rate of change of, okay, is the increase of a certain parameter with respect to the mass, right? So if we want to get the mass, we need the density multiplied by, by the volume. And basically, that gives us the mass of this section here. We multiply that by the intensive property, we get the extensive property. Uh, clear enough. However, we can re-express 1, okay, oh sorry, V1 as the area of 1, okay, multiplied by this thing over here, which is the area multiplied by the small change in length, which is going to be equals to V1 and change in T, right, and we're going to divide that by change in T, so if we were to just erase it, okay, and if we were then later take the limit, as change in t tends towards zero, we'll have the rate of change of the extensive property of one, the volume of one, is equals to density one, p1, a1, v1. Okay? I hope you can see that that is all well said and done. And obviously, if we do the same for b2, we can just simply write two is equals to density of two, b2, a2, v2. Now, I want to really re-emphasize time and time and again that the density, the intensive property, and the area for B1 and B2 do not, uh, may not be the same. In most cases, they're not the same because, as you can see, the volume is definitely different, the density is going to be different, and it could be moving at different speeds as well, different velocities. So that's why we need to make the, the one subscript and the two subscript extremely clear. Right? Okay, so this is what we have. These two equations correspond to this over there, and we have found that out, which I erased it. But now let's just rewrite everything to give us the equation that we so desire. Now, remember the left-hand side. The left-hand side was actually the change of the, the extensive property of the system with respect to time, and then we take the limit. So we got the material derivative of the extensive property of the system with respect to time is going to be equals to the partial derivative of the extensive property of the control volume, which we express as this, 
dv and it's gonna plus v1 right it's gonna plus v1 so we're gonna plus v1 v1 is over here sorry subtract v1 my apologies subtract v1 why is v1 v1 is the rate of change of the extensive property of one which i erased away is in the diagram okay which is the density b1 a1 and v1 and after that we're gonna plus b2 the extensive property of volume 2 which is the density 2 b2 a2 and v2 and ladies and gentlemen boys and girls fluid mechanics students i present to you reynolds transport theorem in one dimension this is the equation that we have uh, very, I must say, when you look at the equation, it looks very formidable and it looks very difficult to implement. That's why I do hope to have a subsequent amount of examples to show you, okay? But I believe this is what we, we so desire for us to continue our study. Now, there's a, certain, uh, there's a certain restrictions to it, and in fact, there's a lot of restrictions, okay? The first one is that, obviously, we're looking at a fixed volume, okay? Fixed volume given by the control volume over here. However, it's a fixed volume with one inlet and one outlet okay our first restriction what is the inlet the inlet is basically this one over here yes is this one over here what is the outlet the outlet is this one over here the inward inlet and outward of the fluid or how the fluid can enter or exit is it reasonable yeah because well, if you look at like i said jet engines normally they have one inlet and one outlet so it's given by these two over here okay what is the second restriction the second restriction is that we have uniform acceleration okay and intensive property along plane of in in or outlet okay going back to our analysis if you can recall that we we looked at the funnel or we looked at the tube right and we assume that the velocity here is, is the same. That means there is no velocity distribution. The velocity here is going to be the same throughout the whole plane. If I were to draw three-dimensional, we should be like that. So all the particles going in will go at a certain velocity. That's why you got uniform acceleration. It's not, it should be velocity. Oh, acceleration and velocity. So it's uniform velocity and acceleration and intensive property. We represented the intensive property for the whole plane as, as B, B1. So we, it's uniform, it doesn't change of the plane of the inlet and the outlet. So we're looking at the plane. Now obviously, when we move over here, the velocity is going to change, no, no doubt about that. But we're looking at the plane. So if you're looking at a three-dimensional view, there cannot be a velocity gradient. Which sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't. But if there's no velocity gradient, then we can use the one-dimensional analysis, which is this equation over here. Okay, so that is what we have. Reynolds theorem in uh, one-dimensional analysis, this big equation over here. but. Do not be turned out by it because we're going to uh, use some interesting examples to explain its implementation. Okay? Yeah, thank you.